Hey everyone, Anthony Fantano here, the internet's busiest music nerd. I hope you're doing well. The 2010s were a crazy time for music. Maybe not the craziest time, a pound for pound when compared with any other decade, but certainly you could say it was a time for creative chaos, uh, sometimes incredible inconsistency, because not only did the radically changing musical landscape put a lot of artists in a position where they didn't exactly know how to keep up with the times, but also the ability for just about anybody to put out any album that they want at any time, regardless of the quality level or how much they worked on it. It, it, it led to some stinkers, because obviously the ease of releasing records digitally, uh, especially during a time when people don't even need to pay for entry per se via piracy or streaming. Yeah, it kind of lowers the stakes of, of putting out a new album. So what I'm essentially trying to do here is uh, list out the 30 albums that to me were the most disappointing releases of the 2010s. Albums that we wanted to be good, that we hoped would be good, but then completely missed the mark. Also keep in mind, I know there are way more than 30 albums that were released in the 2010s that were disappointing in some form or fashion. Feel free to throw any record you feel I've missed down into the comments. And also this list is in no particular order, as this list is not necessarily an assessment of how bad or awful any of these albums are or a ranking of that. It's merely me saying there were at least some high hopes going into these projects that were pretty much dashed upon their release. And with that being said, let's uh, slide over the, f the first album here. Chance the Rapper, The Big Day. First record on the chopping block here. Uh, do I even need to explain why this was a disappointment? This is like roundly accepted by everyone to be one of the biggest misses in all of popular music throughout the 2010s. And look, I'm not even the biggest Chance the Rapper fan. I didn't go into this record uh, thinking uh, that any project he dropped, frankly, up to the lead up of this was uh, amazing or mind blowing. But considering just like, how much mainstream clout Chance had at the time of this record, uh, how many good or uh, great songs he had released up until this point, and how much of the industry was so desperate to work with him around this project and uh, make it something good, make it something special. There's no reason this album should have come out as awful as it did. I would even go as far as to say that this album is a really not a reflection of Chance the Rapper's actual musical talent. And yet somehow we got the album that, that we did as if, um, I don't know, the quality of record releases is uh, somehow based upon pure stupid luck. Next on the list, uh, we are going M83 Junk. Really, truly no idea what happened with this record. I mean, as far as Indietronica goes or modern electronic pop music, uh, M83 is far from one of my favorite projects out there. There are even some albums in the you know projects catalog that I would say are a tad bit overrated. But even by M83's usual standards, uh, Junk was a massive step down and just sort of uh, made me wonder what all the hype was about in the first place, I suppose, on some level. After this, I am uh, going Brockhampton iridescence. For anybody who knows and has followed the Brockhampton story, uh, like you pretty much know the drama and the lead up and the lineup shift that led to the release of this record. And while iridescence uh, definitely didn't turn out as bad or as awful as it could have, still in retrospect, the record reads like, I don't know, like a, a test or a paper or a piece of homework that you had to rearrange or change a bunch of your answers on last minute. You guys know what I'm saying. This just feels like a, a very last minute a chop job to sort of like make this album work in some way, shape or form, despite the fact that the group underwent a pretty massive lineup shift uh, just before the record came out. OK, next after this, uh, that would be Lil Wayne's Rebirth, really digging early into the 2010s for this one. Now, you may say, Anthony, you are absolutely positively insane if uh, you had high hopes at all 
uh, for a Lil Wayne rock album, essentially. And yeah, okay, true. You know, you 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 have a fair point, but um, you know, did, did the record need to be so bad? It's essentially torture. Like, yeah, sure, it wasn't going to be amazing. It wasn't going to be one of the best Lil Wayne albums ever. Like that much uh, was clear. But like, did it need to be so bad that Wayne fans are essentially like afraid to utter the title? Uh, of this record uh, no after this uh another massive dud from a massive 2000s uh hip-hop artist uh that would be eminem revival another album that at this point kind of feels like it doesn't really need explaining it's kind of widely understood by everyone to be his uh, worst record especially considering like marshall mathers lp2 just happened we know eminem can put out some great stuff when like you know the stakes are high and there's a bit of a fire under his ass but revival in terms of like songwriting ideas, collaborations, and uh, really just cringe bars uh, is a nightmare and a half. Next on the list, uh, we are going Logic Supermarket, which again, like the Lil Wayne record, uh, it, it, sure, you could make the point that uh, we shouldn't be expecting a Logic rock and kind of pop-ish album to be great, but still, did it need to be as bad as as it was, that Lemon Drop track still haunts me to this day. Plus, uh, we, we've given poor Bobby enough of a hard time off of this record. Let's move on. Also, we, we've given uh, uh, Scott Miscuddy uh, enough of a hard time off of this record right here. Kid Cudi, Speeding Bullet to Heaven, which again, sure, you could say, Anthony, uh, a Kid Cudi rock album wasn't going to be mind-blowing, especially since he had already kind of dabbled in that style prior and you know had some mixed results and also yes it is true that in retrospect of giving this record uh, uh the lowest possible score that i could uh part of me is kind of enamored with it in a way with how out there it is and uh, how much Cuddy really kind of went for it with this album being as indulgent as it is uh and as you know uh I guess unashamedly bad it is at points and and also it's 90 friggin minutes but still with that being said you can't really ignore the fact that upon release that this record truly was a shock and while you could say that it has uh, its merits uh Kid Cudi really did not give a fuck on this album and it certainly walked so records like the uh, you know recent Lil Yachty uh Psych pop extravaganza he just dropped uh, could run that much is true but uh, again uh, the release of this album was definitely still something and it's nowhere near one of kid cuddy's best next we are doing flying lotus flamagra i'm still kind of wondering what the heck this album was trying to be it's really just a strange album for one of the most uh, pioneering, exciting, and uh, bold and creative producers of the 2010s to have released. Because with his approach to uh, synthesizers, effects, grooves, uh, Flying Lotus really did in many ways like reinvent uh, the hip hop production handbook really in ways I feel like we're yet to fully appreciate. He was just on a creative streak in the late 2000s and early 2010s that uh, is going to need to be studied in retrospect with how much impact and influence he had on the way that a lot of beats were sounding. But uh, Flamagra is really just um, I, I, I feel like him kind of losing that plot line a bit. And really the first full length album that I could truly say was uh, not only behind the curve, but also saw him kind of wading into the weeds and experimenting in ways that uh, didn't quite land. All right. Following this, uh, we are going uh, Crystal Castles, Amnesty. Now, with Alice Glass having departed from the duo before this came out, like no possible way was this thing going to friggin be good. But like, it's still disappointing that it happened, not just because of the awful allegations that came out in the way wake of this album, but also even if none of that came to light, uh, Alice Glass to uh, really all Crystal Castles fans was uh, such an important and vital 
part of the duo's music and appeal, regardless of whatever you could argue was the ratio of creative input musically or production wise from uh, Alice or Ethan, and just swapping her out with another vocalist with uh, another front woman as if uh, you know she's just like replaceable like that w- was really fucked up. Was only going to yield the uh, type of shitty results you actually hear when you listen to this album. After this, uh, we have Yeah, Yeah, Yeah's Mosquito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This album is uh, pretty awful. Like, on the surface, I get how you might be able to misconstrue this album for a return to form as it is kind of the band indulging again in their uh, reverby, raw, sort of messy garage rock punk sound. But the awful and redundant and reductive lyrics throughout these tracks are kind of proof of the band's lack of songwriting inspiration on this thing. That Dr. Octagon feature is really uh, quite a mess and a very awkward inclusion as well. But yeah, this is uh, quite handily the band's worst album, I'll say that. Um, Weezer, Pacific Daydream. You could argue that uh, I could probably put at least a few Weezer albums in this list, (laughs) considering that the band's uh, discography tends to be kind of rocky. They really have a reputation for inconsistency, uh, to say the least. But I have limited myself to one singular Weezer choice in this list, and uh, I'm going with Pacific Daydream. This record truly is the sound of the band, like writing some of their most saccharine, annoying, synthetic, and uh, soulless music yet in their entire catalog. After this, uh, we are going Tool Fear Inoculum, which, uh, yeah, the famed progressive metal outfits comeback album over here that uh, many fans to this day will defend. Uh, I I will say that. uh, Maybe this is just more my opinion that this album was a massive disappointment. But the thing about this record, though, is that to me, it sort of loses sight of what made Tool's music originally throughout their entire catalog good. Rather than give us mind bending, creative, psychedelic, meditative, uh, progressive metal tracks that are thrilling and exciting at the same time, uh, we got a bunch of indulgent jams that go much of nowhere a lot of the time, really stale out within minutes. Again, really anything that made Tool interesting to begin with is kind of missing on this record. While on some level the vibes are certainly there, there's just no punch to this album. After that, uh, we are going Katy Perry Witness, which given the release of her new record 143, uh, is kind of retrospectively being seen as like the beginning of the end for Katy Perry. Like it was really this record that began to uh, end her winning streak in the pop realm, as there wasn't really anything super memorable to come off of this album, and every project she's dropped since this record has just gotten worse and worse. After this, uh, we are going ASAP Rocky at long last ASAP. I know there are a lot of Rocky fans uh, that are going to disagree with me on this one massively, but still to this day, I just don't really see the appeal of this album per se. It sees Rocky kind of going back to uh, his kind of classic cloud wrapped form, and yet almost none of the material is as good as anything as we got off of his breakout mixtape. And simultaneously, you don't really have any of the massive commercial smashes that we got off of his you know, big commercial debut. With that being said, though, I am very much looking forward to the next uh, Rocky album, and it's just been too damn long since we've got a, a record from him, because I, I do think he is genuinely one of the more interesting and creative voices and you know figures uh, within 2010s hip hop. After this, uh, we are doing Birds in the Trap, Travis Scott, another album that uh, for whatever reason his fans come to the defense of despite the fact that it is painfully mid and I think came out uh, in a bit of a rush. Like this thing came out within pretty much a year of his uh, incredible commercial studio full-length debut rodeo and you can really hear it pretty much all the tracks on this thing sound like mid-ass rodeo leftovers and i feel like the unfortunate thing about this record is that travis scott essentially learned the lesson that he took from it is that he didn't actually need to pack his songs with good and thoughtful and memorable songwriting that he didn't actually need to give us cool and interesting song structures per se, on his songs. He could merely kind of 
hit us with a vibe and just repeat that ad nauseum until the track finishes and that'll be just enough for people to consume it and think it's good because you're not really getting the super catchy multifaceted uh sort of progressive song structures that you got off a of rodeo that were so amazing sure while to a degree that did come back uh, quite a bit on the following album Astro World a lot of the deep cuts on that record aren't super strong at least not as strong and consistent as what we got off a of rodeo but yeah with every year that passes birds in the trap just kind of proves itself to be less and less interesting uh, in comparison with all of Travis's other albums. And outside of a couple of tracks, there's not really much reason to go back to it. Moving on from there, uh, we're doing Fall Out Boy Mania, which may be an album you could argue that, uh, Anthony, there's no reason to expect a Fall Out Boy album at this point in the band's career to be great. And sure, that is true. Uh, I don't think I or much of anybody had super, super, super high hopes for this album. However, like it really, truly is so bad and so shockingly awful that even the band's most devoted fans like could not come to the defense of this album, as it was pretty much the band throwing their entire rock appeal into the garbage and instead like uh, almost like writing shitty EDM or really just truly some of the worst electro pop uh, to come out this decade. And uh, you know, what's funny is like, uh, it, it's it's almost as if Blink-182 took this same page from Fall Out Boy's book and are like, yeah, we're, we're going to write a terrible, synthetic, overproduced album too. That record is not uh, on this list. I will uh, uh, spoil it and, and say that. You know what? There's only room for one band of emo and pop punk legends on this list uh, deciding to gravitate away from their classic sound and write a electronic piece of crap and, and yeah it's this one this this is the one all right um after this we have a uh, arcade fire with everything now yeah the band really lost the plot on this one it, it it's unfortunately the sound of the group trying to write almost like a commentary a satire a parody on like some kind of futuristic soulless music and art and rather than successfully nailing that down, they actually ended up just creating the thing that they're supposed to be, I don't know, ripping on in a way. Uh, so yeah, you know, in, in, in the process of kind of commenting on how lifeless and uninspired the present day is, the future looks, uh, they just wrote a very uninspired album. After this, uh, we are going Vampire Weekend, Father of the Bride. Yeah, you could really hear that Rostam left the group on this one. I'm going to say that. I'm going to leave it there. The new record's a banger, though. The new record is a banger. All right, next, uh, Animal Collective, Centipede Hurts, a record that sits at a peculiar point in the band's discography, for sure, an album that, in retrospect, there is a lot of conversation around uh, in terms of whether or not it's actually uh, bad or a disappointment in any way, shape, or form. You could argue in a way that this record was uh, the group returning to form to some degree as uh, it's more along the lines of the uh, very abstract and out there and electronically enhanced psychedelia uh, that they were known for. And it was actually the very sweet and catchy and pop centric Meriwether Post Pavilion that was more of the uh, departure. But personally, with all of the muddy mixes and stagnant song structures, there aren't just a whole lot of colors or thrills to be had uh, throughout Centipede Hurts, in my opinion. And regardless of how people feel about the album now, there was definitely like kind of a, a cool down point happening. After this, uh, Gorillaz, Humans, a record that for many Gorillaz fans is really kind of like the, the weakest major studio album in the group's catalog. And for good reason, as the songwriting across the record is not that great, the production much of the time is okay. Uh, 2D's vocals are not nearly as prominent as they could have been. The features kind of overtake a lot of the tracks on the record, and I kind of feel like you lose sight of what exactly a frickin' Gorillaz album is. Obviously, a lot of money and focus and ambition went into this project, uh, but um, I feel like in the process of doing a record that was so big and uh, was trying to be so over the top, uh, Gorillaz kind of like lost its personality as a musical project in a way. After this, uh, LCD Sound System. American Dream. There are some LCD Sound System fans that will uh, very much disagree with me on this one big time, and I get it. 
I understand. There are even some tracks off this record that have grown on me since I have uh, kind of re-listened to the Electric Lady sessions that were recorded post the release of this album. Kind of hearing them in that more raw and live state, uh, I feel like just kind of makes them more appealing. With that being said, like the production and mixes on this album are not as clear or as punchy or as interesting as pretty much anything you could compare them to in LCD Sound System's back catalog. James Murphy's uh, various attempts at social commentary across this record a lot of the time fall flat. The choruses are not that great, and I feel like the band loses a lot of touch with uh their usual dance appeal on this project as well. Plus, it's a very odd album contextually to exist because it wasn't too long before this record that the band had this big, uh, you know, dramatic breakup with uh, Madison Square Garden show and everything like that. Continuing on, though, we also have Lana Del Rey, Born to Die, a record whose tacky production and god awful lyrics and weak, 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 weak lead vocals uh, were a major disappointment uh, for anybody who is like uh, coming into this record with super high hopes considering how much hype Lana burst onto the scene with. That's not to say that uh, I'm against Lana starting her career or having a career. I mean, I loved her latest full-length album. I feel like she has come a long way vocally and uh, lyrically since the release of this record. I mean, just by law of averages, not every artist is going to have a super strong start I'm not saying I would rather this album not exist or anything like that. In fact, uh, you know, I think it's actually really impressive uh, how much Lana has grown since the release of this album. But with that being said, if you were there at the time, you very clearly remember that there was uh, a lot of back and forth. This album was very polarizing when it came out because tracks like video games were just so huge. They were unignorable and it sort of seemed like Lana was the hot new thing that everybody sort of needed to be on board with. And when this album came out, it really did kind of fall short of everyone's expectations for the most part. After this, uh, it is Justice with Audio Video Disco, which uh, not only was a pretty huge departure from uh, the incredible house debut they made with Cross, but it really just did not measure up to that album in any way, shape, or form, even if the duo was trying to consciously uh, you know, verge away from that a bit and kind of dive more into the funk and pop and disco music that was uh, influencing uh, their brand of electronic music. We also have a uh, Drake Views, which I know there's going to be some Drake stands that are like, hey, Views isn't bad, but I'm sorry, coming off of a mixtape as hard and as great and as consistent as if you're reading this and then going to this, yeah, that's a step fucking down. In fact, that's several steps down. I'm sorry. Uh, we also have the Strokes, Come Down Machine, which we were definitely coming down on this album, uh, really the blandest and most underwritten Strokes album to date, a record that uh, thankfully the band has very much bested since its release. Seems like uh, these days are very much behind the band at this point, and, um, and I'm, I'm glad for it. Lupe Fiasco Lasers, really one of the most awkward genre transitions any hip-hop artist uh, attempted to make in the 2010s. I feel like, unfortunately, Lupe was a bit of a canary in the coal mine with this one and was really kind of like experimenting with the idea of a rapper who was as lyrical and as, uh, you know, kind of like alternative in his backpack as him flirting with the idea of like, you know, doing more pop stuff, more electronic stuff. And the album just turned out to be the nightmare that it is. Thankfully, though, Lupe has gone on to uh, make some incredible records and really kind of like return to form uh, in numerous ways. Uh, we have also Radiohead, The King of Limbs. I feel like there has been a lot of ink spilled, a lot of pixels posted about why this record is weak in comparison with the rest of Radiohead's catalog. Um, I don't really know if I have anything to add to <laughs> that discourse at this point, uh, at least not anything that I haven't already said a million friggin' times as, you know, I was literally there reviewing this album uh, upon release, uh, was unimpressed with it when it came out, and I'm still unimpressed with it now. But uh, at least we have the smile, I guess. Uh, and, uh, you know, Moonshape Pool is uh, an incredible record as well. Uh, moving on from there, uh, Tyler, the creator, Cherry Bomb. Yeah, this album sort of seemed like Tyler was uh, trying to go back to his 
uh, edgy side was trying to be a version of himself that just didn't really exist anymore. However, you know, you definitely did have some musical ideas cropping up here and there that uh, were setting things up for what would come uh, on Flower Boy. So it's definitely a necessary transitional point of sorts. But uh, yeah, terrible production, terrible songwriting, Tyler trying too hard. And, uh, you know, in numerous ways, he himself has acknowledged that this album and what he was doing at this point in his career uh, wasn't very good. And some of it was even coming from a place of insecurity, even. Uh, we also have uh, Kanye West, Jesus is King. I know this era of Kanye's career is uh, pretty rough and inconsistent. There's no denying that. But there really was no reason for this record to come out as garbage as it did. Not only does it fail on a production front, it also fails on a songwriting front. It fails on a lyrical front. It fails on also uh, the, the, the front of what it's trying to do conceptually, because obviously Kanye is trying to make a statement of you know his devotion to Christ and to Christianity on this record on some level, but it just kind of ends up being an indulgent piece of shit. The only good thing this album did truly was that um, it got clips back together. <laughs> And finally, last one on the list here is going to be uh, what is currently the uh, last album, The Roots, released, and then you shoot your cousin. While it's far from like the worst, worst, worst album uh, on this list or the worst album you could listen to, you have to admit it's a disappointment and it's not that great by The Roots' usual standards, which are obviously, when you look at the band's catalog, very high. Like in the world of hip hop, there are few discographies that are as consistent and are as creative and go as hard as the Roots catalog. Like even the relative low moments and and, and minor records, uh, especially during like that 90s and 2000s era, uh, are great and are worth listening to. But things really do kind of drop off here um, on this 2014 album because it's just such a scant record. It doesn't really have like I think the details and the production and the conceptual magic that uh, some of their best records do, especially considering like this album came off of Undone, which frankly is one of the most interesting albums in the band's catalog. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't quite know what it is that made this album as weak as it did. Maybe it's just kind of the fact that uh, the Roots have so much going on in their career at this point, and they are so just established, and there are so many other obligations in front of them as uh, a music group, uh, other than just kind of making new albums. They're pretty much veterans of the game at this point. They don't need to write new music per se for people to listen to their old records, for people to go to a show. I mean, I've even been to a fucking Roots concert since the release of this album. So yeah, while I think this album is handily the weakest in their catalog and it was a massive drop off from the uh, previous record, it in no way sort of like defines the group's impact or influence or creativity uh, in any way. Boom, there you have it. The 30 most disappointing albums of the 2010s, in my opinion. Again, make sure to let me know yours down in the comments. I'm sure you will. Over here next to my head is another video that you could check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, disappointing albums forever.